Okay. Uh, welcome to our uh, January STC Florida chapter meeting, uh, Writing for Everyone, Inclusive Technical Communication. My name is Bethany Aguad. I currently am not anything beyond a very active member in this chapter because I am on STC's board of directors. So I'm here happy to present along with Julia and Jesslyn on this topic. Before we get into the actual presentation, Alex had a few pieces of news about our chapter. Cool, so thank you. Um, I would like to welcome everybody, as uh, Bethany said, to our January chapter meeting. Um, I'm, I'm really glad to see a lot of new faces here. Um, and I'm glad that you could find our chapter and our meeting. Um, I do wanna invite you to join or renew your SDC membership that um, the link is there in the in the um, PowerPoint and will be sent out later. And that's uh, sdc.org and you can find all the information there. Um, thank you, Bethany. And our February meeting is our annual UCF um, joint meeting with the future technical communicators. And that will be on Friday, February 26th. And I wanna emphasize that that's gonna be a Friday because we usually meet on Thursdays. So that's, uh, I'll say it again, Friday, February 26th at 6.30 p.m. Uh, generally, we would meet on campus, um, but due to everything that's going on, as we know, um, it's gonna be virtual um, and we will have uh, RSVP and more information on it as it is available, but just save that date and it will be um, a career um, in tech writing panel, basically. Um, so you can find out what um, what's available in, in the tech comm um, industry. Uh, we do wanna invite you to join us on our uh, Slack workspace um, where we get together, we, uh, we talk about chapter business, we uh, plan, so uh, we, are always looking for volunteers. Um, you know, you you you, put, you get out what you put in. So we're a great community, and uh, join us. We will uh, find something for you to do, as as we always say. Um, we're always on uh, social media, Facebook and Twitter, or LinkedIn. Um, join us and uh, continue the conversation. So uh, back to Bethany and uh, and Julia with the program. Thanks, Alex. Mm -hmm. If you hear a sad cat, I'm sorry. It's the one I banished. So apologies about that. If you hear little sad sounds, she's fine. I just kind of want to go over what we're going to talk about today. And uh, we're going to be going over the importance of inclusive communication. So some background on general principles. Uh, then Julia is going to be talking about writing for gender identities using pronouns and neurodiversity. Uh, I will be talking about privilege and biases. And then Jesslyn's going to bring it all together by uh, talking about a case study in embracing diversity in the tech world. And then at the end, we'll have questions. If you have questions along and along, feel free to put them in the chat. Alex has kindly offered to be our chat moderator. So he'll gather those or respond where possible um, or just you know bring them to us at the end. So feel free if you have anything yeah. that co comes up and you don't want to forget. I will be right here. Okay, so the importance of inclusive communication. I know I mentioned a little bit earlier about the background on this. This is something Julia is really passionate about and has been sharing with me. So uh, Julia is actually my mentee. So this is one of those you know reverse mentoring situations where I am learning from her and I'm excited to kind of bring this topic to you. We are not experts by any means. I would say we're just very passionate people about what we are learning about inclusive communication. So. We certainly don't want it to be seen that we have all the answers or the end all be all, but we've taken our time, done our research, had a lot of really good conversations, and we want to, you know, pass on what we've learned so far in our experience. There are a lot of definitions for inclusive communication. This was one that I thought made the most sense to me. It was actually from uh, the Scotland College of Speech and Language Therapists, uh, where they said inclusive communication is an approach to communication which enables as many people as possible to be included in that interaction. So at its base, we're just trying to make sure people are included in our interactions. And I know as technical communicators, we communicate in many you know, modes and forms. So this covers all the different tools and methods we might use. Just a few principles of inclusive communication in general. 
Number one, empathy. It's not just something we're doing to have it done, check things off a list. It's something we're doing because we want to care about the people around us and make sure we're sharing our information with them and listening to what they have to say. And it's a, you know something that we are not going to do and have done and move on from. It's something we continuously work on. It's also part of our culture. I know it's something we've talked about here in the Florida chapter. Alex especially has been really good about championing diversity initiatives within the chapter. And I know that's happening at the STC uh, national, international level as well. So we're just trying to think about how we can make our community or, you know, if you're at school or on the job, make it a more inclusive culture. So we can't necessarily rely on these things to come from the top down as much as we'd like to have, you know, inclusive communication principles come, you know, down to us. At the bottom level, we can work on building those up. So making sure in each of our interactions, whether it's in the written word or in video or on Zoom calls that, you know, we're doing our best to model uh, inclusive behaviors. So the last is empowerment. So that's kind of what we're trying to do here is provide you some of the tools that we've gained on how to, uh, you know, be inclusive to those around us and to model that behavior going forward. So it's not something where we see it as, you know, we're just going to give this to you and then, you know, you're, you're not going to have to work on it any further. And it's not something that we see that we have done and are completed doing. We're just trying to continue to work towards being more inclusive in everything we're doing. So uh, for how this actually relates to TechCom specifically, because we wanted to bring it back to what's going to be practical for us as technical communicators. We are always taught, uh, whether in school or on the job, that we are creating something that is user focused. We want our communication and our documentation to be useful to our users to accomplish their goals. So inclusive communication just means we're also making sure that the broadest possible audience can engage with what we're doing. We also are great and embracing different modes of communication. So I think it's something as a skill we can bring, seeing different ways and opportunities of connecting with people and providing the information they need in a way that resonates with them. When it comes to messaging, we want people to understand, engage with our message and not in any way feel like it's something that doesn't, uh, you know, something that doesn't connect with them or that they don't understand or that alienates them in some way. So we're just bringing people together with what we're trying to share. And uh, I know throughout the communication process, uh, we're not just always telling what's happening at the end, but we're trying to make sure that our products and our services are accessible and usable for everyone, because at the end of the day, that's what keeps us in business. So it's thinking about all these different ways that we can make sure we're doing the best job we can, not just because it's going to help us you know, achieve our goals, but also because it's going to make us better people. So I'm going to hand it to Julia to talk about gender identity pronouns and neurodiversity. Okay, let me go into present mode. Okay, hello Brie. I did borrow that from a YouTuber. I will get to that momentarily. I'm discussing gender identity pronouns and neurodiversity. I'm Julia Selpik, my pronouns are she, her. I saw Alex put his pronouns in chat. Feel free to add yours if you would like. Um, I am the newsletter editor at STC Florida and I'm happy to share what I've learned with you. Okay, first off, gender identity is complicated. I do not know all of them, but I know a fair few. We likely all know male and female, maybe a few others. In the book by Ash Hardell, she changed her name after it was published, the ABCs of LGBT plus and the free PDF, which I will link to at some point, I'll find the link. But first, let's go over some of them. I have the book handy. Please pick out a couple and I will define them. Feel free to shout them out. How about FTM? I've never heard that one. FTM, that is female to male. And let's see what the book says. If I can find the right page. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, it just says FTM acronym for female to male. So someone who was assigned female at birth and they're actually a man, that's what they would say. Okay, great. Thanks, Julia. Yep. How about demigender? Okay. Demigender, someone who has or experiences a partial connection to one or genders. Okay. Okay, I'm going to move to the next slide. There's oh. more. Can just I just ask? Oh, gray gender? <laughs> Sorry. Gray I mean, gender. Yep. Is it just someone who yep. likes to decorate with gray? Like, I, <laughs> no, no. I knew that wasn't it, but I just thought someone's going through my mind. So I have to find the right page first. <laughs> That's always the key. Uh, there it is. Gray gender. This identity involves having a weak sense of gender and or being somewhat apathetic about one's gender identity or expression. Oh, okay. Interesting. So I got a question. What is, I saw like female to female and male to male on the previous slide. What does that mean? Someone who was assigned female at birth but believes that they have always been a male and they're formally transitioning to be a male and vice versa. Uh, okay. Uh, Thank you, Miss Hurd. It's female to female. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. With male to male or MTM, someone whose sex and or gender was assigned female at birth and who rejects their gender was ever female. Uh, so just because it says a gender on your birth certificate, that doesn't mean that you truly identify with it. And someone may have the belief that I was always this gender and my birth certificate doesn't reflect that. Okay, and that's different from like female to male or male to female? Yeah, it's just which term they prefer to use. Okay, I guess that makes sense. Like I said, it's complicated. It takes time to wrap your head around some of them. It doesn't make sense. How about uh, Neutroi? Neutroi. Neutroi. That takes root from French. Someone who's gender is neutral or no. Okay, I think I'm gonna move on. Okay. We've likely all heard the pronouns she, her, he, his, and they, them, but maybe somebody doesn't like those options. In the book on page 83, there's a table of different alternatives. These slides will be available later. I'm not gonna ask you to memorize them. I'm gonna take a minute and read them to myself. I encourage you to do the same. If I may, I'd love to know your opinion, Julia, because I, when I look at this, my, just as a tech writer, my thought is, I know that there's um, agreement grammar issues with they, them, but that's what I tend to use because some of these, I'm like, wow, that's fascinating, but I can't help but think someone will think it's a typo or that you, there's been a mistake and, and that will lead to other questions having nothing to do with gender. And as a tech writer, it would, I was just curious if, if anyone has opinions about that or some research on that. For me personally, I also prefer to use they, them as my go-to neutral, but if someone were to prefer something else, then perhaps it's a good idea to, like it does at the very top of the image, say for people who don't want to use they, this is a pronoun that they use, and then from there continue using that other pronoun. Does that make sense? It does, it makes sense. I was just thinking it's a unique challenge. I'm sure this is uh, something that I should have thought of and now it's obvious to me, but I, I didn't think of it when the topic first came out. I thought that's just a challenge for adopt, adoption, 
adoption of these these standards is that they'll automatically it'll make people think you just made a typo when you didn't. Yeah, and you probably have to have a disclaimer or something, or not a disclaimer, but an explanation as to that 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 is technically correct. I'm like this, but I was just trying to think it through in my head how to adopt that. But great explanation. Yep. Okay, I'm going to guess that we've all read through it. If not, it's okay. Like I said, these slides will be available later. Neurodiversity. Story is different. This is my personal story. Remember how I said I borrowed something from a YouTuber? That's how to ADHD. I have ADHD, and there are three primary types. You've got your hyperactive presentation, which is your stereotypical ADHD person, and the ones who are likely to squirrel get distracted easily. You've also got the primarily inattentive presentation. Those are your daydreamers, the ones who are most likely to say, wait, what? And the most common presentation is the combined type, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's both hyperactive and inattentive in different ways and different amounts. For me, sometimes I have too many thoughts. My thoughts are racing and I have trouble stopping them in a presentation. Like right now. It's great to have bullet points so that I don't get distracted by those racing thoughts. I'm also time blind, so I tend to use a timer a lot. And if you've ever read one of those articles on Facebook or wherever you like to read, and it has that little it takes about this long to read this article. I find that very helpful and it might be something worth looking into for tech writers as well. One of the strengths and sometimes weaknesses of having ADHD is the ability to hyper-focus. In other words, you're focused on that one thing almost to the exclusion of everything else which is also how I got these slides done in one night. <laughs> it was fun though. Um, and my ADHD brought a friend to the party. Her name is Anxiety. I also have that. So sometimes I fidget, which is why I bought a fidget cube. You can see an example in the image. Sometimes, in addition to racing thoughts, I overthink a lot, which can be a little tricky to stop, but I've got some strategies under my belt and they work pretty well. Sometimes that racing thoughts and or overthinking turns into what looks like just staring at a wall because there's too much going on in my head and I can't think anymore. I can't move anymore. I am able to break out of it. Sometimes it takes a few minutes, but I'm able to do that. Other times the anxiety presents itself as there's too much energy and I just have to move. So I typically will pace around the house for a little while until I settle down. I believe that's the end of my slides, so I will pass this along to Bethany. Where's the stop presenting button? Am I back? I think I, sh I should be sharing my screen now. I think I hijacked it. Can you guys see uh, privilege and biases? Yep. Okay, yep, you great. Did. Good. Yeah, uh, and I see the chat has been very active. Feel free to keep your, your thoughts and, and suggestions and questions coming. We'll look forward to you know reviewing them uh, at the end or other yeah, people are welcome to chime in with their thoughts. So uh, for privilege and biases, the, the short story on this is that I am a very privileged person. And for many years, I had the privilege of not realizing I was privileged because of, uh, you know, the economic background of my parents, where I grew up, the educational opportunities I had. You know, I never questioned that I would go to college and that I would get a job that would, you know, become a career for me. And I realized a lot of that has informed how I write, the assumptions I make about my readers. Not that I assume that everyone is exactly like me, but I might assume that I am sort of 
normal, which I think is one of the dangers of coming from a background of privilege and how that feeds into our biases and how we communicate. So uh, this is something I've talked about with Julia that I am working on dismantling. I don't want it to seem like I was privileged and now I have fixed it because that is not how it works. <laughs> Instead, I'm looking at ways that I can resist giving into the biases that come from a privileged background and use my privilege to benefit others. So I certainly don't want it to sound like I'm preaching from the mountaintop where I've had a revelation and I now know everything. Instead, I'm hoping that you guys will be able to sort of see the journey I've been on and what I've learned and maybe some of it will help you or maybe it's things you already know, but I appreciate you, you know, going along with me. So just a little background on what I mean by privilege. Uh, it's unearned access to social power based on membership in a dominant group. Uh, what that dominant group is varies. It's not just checking exactly one specific list of boxes, but different opportunities you've had. Like I said, I know it's something that I did not realize about myself because I was in that sort of blind space where I thought, I have worked hard. I've definitely earned everything I've ever achieved because I do believe I'm a hardworking person, but not seeing that the opportunities I have come from the background I was born into and did not earn in any way. Just a few types of privilege, because there are others. These were ones that I thought might be helpful uh, just for kind of us to look through and some question or statements that might go along with coming from that privileged background. So for those who are white, it's, I've never had been asked to speak for all of the people of my racial group. For those who are male, I can be confident that my coworkers won't think I got my job because of my gender. For those who are straight, I do not need to fight for my legal and social recognition for myself or my family. For those who come from a higher socioeconomic class, I always knew I would go to college. For those who are able-bodied, I can be confident that I would not be rejected for a job because of physical ability. And for those who are from a dominant religious group, I can wear the symbols of my religion without fear. So there are certainly other types of privilege, and I'm not saying these statements are necessarily true for all of us, but I thought it might be helpful in kind of getting you all thinking about where, how that might feed into some of our assumptions and biases about how we communicate with our audiences as technical communicators. All right. So how to check your privilege, <laughs> because this is going to feed in the next section on biases. Uh, that slide was just one I put together on questions and, and or notes I thought were helpful to me about different types of privilege. There are certainly many excellent books I can recommend or articles if you're looking to read up more on that. Um, so identifying your privilege, checking the benefits and advantages you have had uh, in your life that you have not earned. And then I'm say that feeds directly into study inclusive communication. So a loose a list of resources, which Julia has an excellent article for member to members that's already out that we're gonna share the link for at the end on different guides you can use that will help you filter out the things that you might think are normal to say that might be offensive or just uh, othering for people who don't have the same background as you. Uh, the thing I am learning and uh, every day improving is asking people uh, if I am saying something that might be a problem or if there's something in my, my writing, whether it's my emails or my documentation, something that is excluding people rather than including them in what I'm putting together. And kind of the end state is speaking up when you see instances where people are not being included. Um, I know often in our roles, we are kind of the guardians of the communication, whether it's documentation and instructions, or I know like WC has a background in communications more broadly, but uh, not letting things slide when we think that they're excluding people from what we're trying to say, whether that's more, more likely implicitly than explicitly, but questioning and just seeing what we can do in our workplace or our community to make our communications broadly available to everyone. So we talked about privilege to go into biases because this is, this is where privilege leads. <laughs> just a few things that I think I see come up a lot uh, for technical communicators. Uh, is using gendered language. If you worked for a big corporation, there are so many uh, expressions, words, and phrases we use that are just incredibly masculine and might be exclusionary to people. I know I have personally had things that I have been said to me that I thought, well, it's okay because this is just how people talk here. Even if it's not intended from a place of hurt, it definitely can distance people from what you're trying to say. 
uh, cultural and regional biases. I have worked on this a lot myself because I know where the specific place I am from and the family I'm raised in, we have a lot of little, you know, fun idioms, expressions, that sort of thing that are broadly understood to me and the people I know in my immediate space because they all live here, but aren't understood by people in other groups and places. So trying to see where we are getting lost in translation with the things we assume are everyday expressions. The insider language. Uh, this is one that happens a lot if you're working for a big corporation is you've got your own lingo, your own phrases, your own ways of speaking that are all known to everyone who works there and seem perfectly normal. And I don't know if you've ever had it where you've said a work phrase to someone outside of work and they look at you like, what are you talking about? Because you're saying something like, I don't have the bandwidth, um, which my husband was like, I don't know what you're trying to say to me right now. I'm like, sorry, it's just a normal work phrase. But often for people who are either new to your company or might be coming from a different place, it could be really distancing to not know what you're talking about. So that's what I'm working on, trying to get better at, especially in writing things for clients outside of my business is not using phrases that we assume are, you know, excellent business speak. Also, they tend to be crutches that aren't great communication anyways. So the more we can be, you know, specific about what we're saying, the better. <clears throat> Sorry. And the last one, uh, generalizations. I think sometimes uh, when we're trying to think, what is something that people from a group different than me want to hear in my communication, we have a tendency to stereotype or to just broadly think that all people from a particular group might have a different perspective or be looking for something. So I don't have a perfect fix for how to always avoid that, but it's something that I think we have to be vigilant for and question ourselves. Maybe why am I communicating this way or what am I trying to achieve by using certain phrases? All right, so I boiled this down into a list of do's and don'ts. This is certainly not everything, uh, but these are the ones that uh, I'm trying to use myself. When it comes to do you sensitive language, that's where I'm trying to think about what are different perspectives others might have. What am I, if I can step outside of myself, which is what, something we're supposed to be doing, we're making user centered communication anyways, how might this be interpreted from a different point of view than my own with the information, knowledge and experiences I'm bringing to it. For being specific about writing about people, that's when you should say something like we're, you know, this is about people ages 18 to 25, instead of saying young people or on the flip side saying old people instead of specific ages they're referring to. So it's just better to say exactly who you are writing about or talking to in those sort of cases rather than just broadly labeling an entire group. For using people first language, this is especially important for people with disabilities. So it's better to say something like individuals with epilepsy rather than epileptics. So that you're emphasizing the people first rather than the disability. Uh, I know Julia had covered so much on gender, <laughs> but I just wanted to make sure to bring this up again to avoid gendered pronouns when you don't know someone's gender. So I know for many, 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 many years, he has been the default. Um, and then we've also got he or she or alternating he and she when coming up with like user stories and that sort of thing. It would just be better to avoid it all together if you can or use the singular they or there. I know people have concerns about how that sounds grammatically, but I think it's something we're just getting used to over time. I think it makes sense. And I think Alex put in the chat that Shakespeare did it, so it must be right. Uh, a couple of things you could do is you could use plural noun pronouns in that case for them, just referring to a collective of people if that works better if you're having issues with the singular they. Or sometimes you could just drop the pronoun altogether. Sometimes you might just be referring to a specific person, just refer to them. Or if you're referring to an engineer, you could just say they're an engineer if you're concerned about it just sounding wrong or, or not you know, hitting the ear right. For don'ts, the don't use offensive expressions. I know I said this and it seems very obvious not to offend people, but I know all along and along, I'm always questioning and finding new things that I have assumed are not offensive because it's how I was raised or it's something that was said or something my grandmother was said. Uh, Nick Ducharme has helped me stop saying gypped because that is a word that I have said very often. I believe I've written it many times, but it does reinforce uh, negative stereotypes about the Romani people. So I am working on banning it from my vocabulary. There are many, many, many things. I don't want you to feel like if you say something that one person finds offensive, it's the end of the world, you're a bad communicator. But instead I'm trying to talk about kind of dismantling things that we might assume I'm not offended by it. Most of the people I know aren't offended by it. Therefore I should use it. 
Um, there are a lot of sort of terminology baked in, especially to software development that is maybe not the best uh, when it comes to what it says about people and gender. So there's a lot of things to work on kind of deprogramming from what we're saying. Uh, I put don't use jargon, double talk and corporate speak. I, are, I know I already referred to this, but there are a lot of uh, interesting things that have been said uh, in various workplaces that I did not understand when I first joined, uh, you know, the company. And then you just get used to saying them. I would say things like low hanging fruit, common corporate term, but it's a very strange thing to say without knowing what, what the specific idiom means. Uh, boil the ocean is another one. When really we're just looking for a quick, easy metaphor to describe something that we all immediately understand. It's sort of a verbal shorthand, but it's really not very clear, effective communication anyways. The worst one I've heard was open the kimono, which is obviously not the most inoffensive term and really just is saying we should be transparent. So why wouldn't we just say we want to be transparent? So uh, I recommend kind of catching those. You might hear them more now. I know I did the more I started thinking about it and catching myself saying them. So I'm trying to do better about just being explicit about what I'm trying to say. For using sexist language, I don't think anyone here is trying to be sexist, but I know there are things that are just, like I said, kind of part of talking about work, like referring to man hours or referring to mankind. Uh, I have heard someone at work refer to women as females. I think in an attempt to just describe a group of women, but it's really not the desired term. So just kind of keep an eye out for those words that there's a better word for, but we just use the one that seems like the normal way to go. I mentioned before colloquialisms and idioms. Uh, some of them you seem really common, like to say things like call a spade a spade. We're just trying to, you know, cut down our explanation for an idea we're trying to say. So I think part of this is as technical communicators challenging ourselves to do better and not to fall back on just easy expressions that we think get our message across quickly. I did mention before using general statements about specific populations. I have seen too often people refer to Asian people as a collective uh, without recognizing there are many countries and cultures with very different experiences in what we call Asia. And it's really not a very accurate or helpful term when referring to your users for your products. So it's something to keep an eye out for. And I was put, don't inject statements based solely on your personal experience. This is what I'm working on. Less of my documentation, more of my communications and emails. For me, I've learned I should not start things with the word typically, unless I'm referring to a specific claim that I have evidence of and information for, because what is typical to me is not necessarily typical to everyone. So overall, it's just sort of about checking yourself and, and looking for opportunities to just be clear, explicit, and helpful and be inclusive. So I am going to hand it off to Jessalyn. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm here to provide a case study um, in embracing diversity. Specifically, I'm talking about an online journal that I launched in December called Technically Different. Um, next slide, please. Where, okay, there we go. Uh, so um, I'm gonna try to go over these different bits fairly briefly. I'll uh, talk about the origins of Technically Different, creating the uh, call for participation, finding submissions, and then also the obstacles that you encounter when you decide to start something like this. Uh, so if we can go to my next slide. Okay, so that you see on the left side of your screen, that's the logo for Technically Different. So what is this online? Well, aside from being an online journal. So it, stemmed, it, it is a product of 2020. I was thinking about this earlier and that is the best way I can describe it. It is a product of living through 2020 and a lot of very important conversations that were finally being had that needed to be had. Um, you know, and can continue, need to continue onward. And so I 
I could not pers my, personally attend any of the protests because of COVID and I live with someone with a compromised immune system and it was just too dangerous of a situation health-wise. So I was trying to think of, could I do something else that could potentially help people? And so I thought, okay, what skills do I have? And luckily I have worked as a research assistant that for the past going on to three years now that focuses on journal production. So a lot of the ins and outs, how to create one, manage the back end and front to back, I've gotten to see. So I focus on that skill set. And um, I initially I kept pitching this idea past people that I knew if it was a really bad idea, they would gently shoot it down or just, you know, I don't know a non-idiom for that. <laughs> Sorry, Bethy, and now I'm thinking about it, Bethany. Um, but anyway, it, it continued onward and as you can see, came into existence. So uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so the first step to making this journal a reality was getting the call for participation made and being able to post it because you can tell people online or in person you're creating a journal but you need something to show them to say here is specifically what i am looking for and why to have a decent chance of actually procuring any submissions and anyone's attention once you have left their eyeline so i drafted a cfp or a call for participation and Thankfully, was able to edit this with my uh, with my boss for my research assistantship, and we were really able to encompass that statement of it's an open access journal. We're trying to get a diverse pool of you know writers and artists that work in digital mediums. Since I I volunteered for SIGGRAPH and bef before uh, in my earlier years as a grad student, so I knew very specifically how broad the realm of digital artists was and I wanted to make sure they were included as well as I've, the tech world is very vast basically and I just wanted anyone to have a shot <laughs> if they wanted to be seen and so we were trying to capture that as far as whether you know different races sexualities identities neurodivergences whatever it is you have if you don't think you have been seen yet or acknowledged we will acknowledge you and we will happily celebrate whatever it is that you do not think has yet been said or seen and we'll do it either via written submissions or through art depending on how you want to tell your story or whatever message you wanted to share and for some reason the thing that sticks out for this for me is when my boss said i am telling you put a word limit Otherwise you have no idea what people will send you. And for some reason that sticks in my head, I don't know why. Um, so, but with the CFP, once I had this to post in social media and send to people, it was then op an option to, I could give people a specific list of, here are some ideas of how you could express yourself. If you have an idea of this sounds, I would love to be in this journal, also, if you just want a publication credit, because sometimes that's what you need as a student to help yourself forward. And it, as a grad student, I can't help thinking that way. Um, so anyway, the point is with the CFP, it was able to finally, I, I could now communicate a message to people of what, what exactly I was talking about. And so if we can go to the next slide, please. And Along with garnering submissions, the website for the journal had to be built. Um, this way, I'm, I made this in WordPress. Um, this is just a screenshot of the homepage. I went with a labyrinth for the logo for kind of that onward journey. Um, not, to, not trying to allude to a minotaur. There's no one waiting to eat anybody. Um, not that I'm aware of and there shouldn't be. So. <laughs> just kind of trying to simulate that or um, symbolize that continual journey people are, are on. And so if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, just to show you, this is 
this is a visited page for our initial issue and that we like, as I think I said, we launched in December and I am very fortunate that I, before I launched the website, I also showed this again to my boss who works on this his, professionally and said, what is missing? This is why we have a lovely graphic to go with it and tie together the branding um, with the purples and whites and just bring it to that professional level uh, to get people to come back. So we had five stories for this first issue. Um, that was a variety we had from kind of an entrepreneurial perspective to a narrative of someone's journey from, I believe from India to coming abroad for school and her journey through different parts of the tech world that she found her place to even an um, including as well a local artist here in Orlando, Florida giving an inside look to how one of her design pieces goes from the beginning with starting with the 3D printer down to the final coat of paint. And just showing, if not necessarily the diversity of the indi of individuals in the tech world, at least showing the diversity of all the things that happen in the tech world. <laughs> As I'm sure everybody here knows, probably more so than I do. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, please. So if anyone is wondering how one procures submissions for something like this when you are still a grad student and you're trying to get this off the ground, well, um, the term I use for myself is shameless weasel because I am a persistent little creature when I am trying to get somewhere or get an answer. Um, I can't help it. I've used the term for years and it's what I do. So how I did this, there was a mix of social media. Like I said, once I had that CFP, I was posting it across Facebook groups, posting it to Instagram. I also posted it on LinkedIn. And initially, I believe for a few weeks, I was hoping people would just message me from seeing the post, say, hey, I want to write about this. Can I do a piece? But that doesn't always happen you have to work with what you got. So what I had were people who liked the post or maybe commented on it. So I reached out to them, very simple, just reached out to them, said, hi, I know you saw this. Would you like to talk about ideas? And I would love to have you be a part of our initial issue. And some of them worked out great. And some people just, they didn't have an idea and they were just supportive of the idea, which was great. And also with universities, since I'm, since I'm still a student, I talked to some of my professors and you know some were really encouraging and said, sure, yeah, can I forward this to my students? Maybe they have an idea. And so it, it's just a certain amount of persistence of, you know, if, if someone thinks your idea is bad, they will tell you. And then most of the time they will go away. <laughs> And people that think your idea is great and want to be part of the conversation you're trying to push forward and be a part of in your own little way, they'll stick around and give you their two cents or whatever they have. And so life will continue on. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but um, here's a slight bit more of an overview of what if you want to go back and take a look at the journal, um, I would, um, what you'll see in the first issue, we um, from um, Daphne's piece where she wanted to promote women in tech, so she designed a clothing line, and so she wrote a nobody about that. We have a creative writing piece where it's this really interesting take on different, how technology across different generations, how different older and younger generations react to tech. And that reflective piece I mentioned of, you know, as you journey through different programs and academics and then professionally finding your place in the tech industry. And that design process with the local artist name is Coven of Cuteness. It does live up to the name, I'm just gonna say. Um, and it was just, I had met her at a conference the previous year, so I reached out to her. And she, uh, in talking, she mentioned that she uses a 3D printer. And 
of all things. So she said, sure, I'll take photos and tell you, walk you through it. And then our final piece was about, was written by actually my assistant editor that she, what, what she felt strongest about was how lonely it was being one of four female um, students in a computer science course. And even, and how it was even the, a male student commented on it, that, wow, it's so weird to see a girl here. And so for her, she wanted to compile a list and just a sort of a short guide for other female students. Say, if you feel lonely being a female computer science student, and I'm sorry, I can't, I, I need to work on my terminology now that, we, now that we talked about it. So I may be the bad example and I'm sorry about that. Um, but anyway, so the um, computer, so she put together a short guide of if you're a female computer science student, here are ways to connect with other students so you do not feel alone and don't feel like you have to drop out of the program because you are too, because there's not enough of you or you know, you're, you have no connection. And I'm sure a lot of people can understand, understand that. It's, it's not uncommon. <laughs> and uh, we can go to my next slide, please. Um, the final thing I wanted to touch on in kind of my little example is the obstacles that for something, whenever you're trying to start anything, I know you'll encounter obstacles. So I wanted to talk about it a little bit. Um, you will get negative. The negative for me is not everyone likes your idea. And sometimes people are jerks. And if things go well, you'll one day get to laugh about it. And if it doesn't go well, you'll forget they said it anyway. Ideally, um, but the negative responses for this honestly don't matter they, because they they said their piece and they're gone. The positive response is, uh, so I started this by myself, and by the time I launched, I had my assistant editor because she reached out. Um, she's in Canada actually, and she's a student, and she just she loved the idea of the project and said I. I want to be a part of this because this is great. This is I this is a message I need to spread myself. So anytime I might have wanted to drop the project because you know as a grad student, um, you know, there's plenty to do, different things I need to get done and whatnot. It's very easy to find a reason to step away from something. I can't because it makes she's passionate about it and it means so much to her so it is worth it so it so it worked out for the better and so it the conversation is worth it having the conversation touching on the gender <laughs> correct pronouns and overcoming biases everything that julia and bethany have talked about tonight uh, it's all worth it to have the conversation. <laughs> um, so that is, I believe, the end of my slides. Yes, awesome. Thank you, Jesslyn. Um, appreciate that. I did share a link uh, to your journal in the chat for those who wanted to go take a look. Oh, thank you. Yeah, uh, Alex, did we have any questions we didn't answer along and along? Uh, yes, uh, there was a couple. Um, so um, there was one earlier from Chun. Um, am I pronouncing that correctly? Okay. Um, so he, they asked, um, are there techniques to use that we don't, so that we don't come off as being biased? Oh, well, <laughs> I think I gave some very specific, uh, you know, tips, uh, I will say on our next slide, which, you know, I'll just flip to it now. Uh, this is the list of some of the resources we put together. They are in the latest issue of Memo to Members that Julia has published, and they have a lot of great information that I recommend reading, because for me, that helped inform things that I might not be looking for. I think as technical communicators, we all have to do some editing of, of our own writing, of others. So I think we already have an editing brain that kicks in when reviewing our communication. So I think it's more about checking for the things that we might not be checking for now, whether that's having a list of specific things to look over or more just having your own kind of internal filter 
to review. I don't think we can get rid of having biases because we are human beings. And, and until the robots and you know the AI can replace us in writing communication, which so far I think we're safe, um, you know, we're still gonna have you know an experience informed by by what we've been around. But just trying to make sure that we're not pushing those biases into what we're creating for other people and to do better about looking outside of what we expect. I hope that answered your question. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. And the next question was from Rebecca. She wanted to know what the difference between gender fluid and gender flux. Okay. Gender fluid is having a gender that changes and gender flux is someone who's experiencing uh, choked there for a sec. <laughs> Let me restart. <laughs> gender flux is someone whose experience with gender changes or fluctuates in intensity. So subtle differences, I think is a lot of it, right, Julia? And just yeah, a lot of it is just subtle differences when two things are similar. And I believe those are the only two that I picked up throughout the presentation. I think we covered a lot of them in the chat and then uh, throughout the presentation. Yeah, so anything else, you're welcome to put your questions in the chat or unmute and ask, ask us live uh, and we will do our best to answer. Um, while we're waiting for that, there was one thing I missed on my slides because I accidentally put it on the wrong slides. I have it in two windows with the same slide deck. <laughs> I forgot. Um, uh, for some people, um, they don't like it when people say things like, that's crazy, or it's simple. It really depends on who you're talking to and what they feel comfortable with. Yeah, Julia and I have had a very frank conversation about uh, the gender neutral guys when referring to a group of people as in, hey, guys, which is one that is a struggle for us as people who are not personally offended by it, but know that it is, despite we us using it often as an ungendered term, a gendered term. Um, this is the list of resources that Bethany and I compiled in the memo to members. Uh, Yeah, so um, what Julia put together is sort of like a like an annotated bibliography. So if you go to and look at that link with the resources, we put a description on what you could use it for, a little detail on what's in the article. Some are short, some are longer, some are slide decks. We try to give a lot of variety. Um, so if you're looking for more information, whether it's specific do's and don'ts or general principles, there is an article there for at least just about everything we thought would be useful to our fellow technical communicators. Do you mind if I ask a question? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Julia. Oh, I was just going to say, I think the only thing on here, the resources list that we did use is the book. I'm not 100% certain on that, but go ahead and ask your question. Well, it's more a topic for discussion because it keeps circling through my mind that, and Bethany, you kicked it off quite wonderfully in a way I hadn't thought about before, which was education level. Mm -hmm. that you assume that you'd always go to college. I didn't really so always assume, but my father was an English teacher. So I sort of, <laughs> I never really took English because I absorbed it by osmosis and not a lot of people do that. <laughs> um, like I knew what behest meant at the age of eight. But <laughs> <laughs> one of the challenges that I have is, and I'm trying to say this in a way because I don't feel that this is a bias, but even when I try to undo the bias, it comes out like one. The majority of my users, um, would have a high school education and sometimes less. And I think that's great. I think that forces me to use my skills to communicate much better, to speak plainly, to speak simply, and it helps me avoid jargon. The challenge that I come up against um, is subject matter experts internally. You know, it's, they wanna up the reading grade level or they think you're dumb, you know, and you don't, <laughs> you can't explain it. And I, I have found myself, I'm wondering if other people have had this experience when I've tried to say, but I'm writing for someone who may not even have a high school degree, which doesn't, I don't see as putting them down. I'm very, I can't fix a car. 
you know, I can't do what these people do. And I've watched them. They, they're incredible at their jobs, but they don't have the language skills that I do. And I don't think there's a problem with that. Yeah. And I'm seeing Donnell, your comment, but I'm just, I'm curious because getting it through the review process, I have found to be where this all comes up and you don't know how to explain that. I know you have a master's degree, but not everybody does. <laughs> and so do I. And it's, it becomes a very, you wind up getting into sticky conversations where it sounds like you're putting your users down and you're not, because I don't think there's any problem with speaking at a fifth grade reading level. I think we should be able to do that. Does that make sense? No. So I'm trying to think where the question was in there, but it was sort of just a, about just like how general, like, yeah, how we could address it that way in terms of being inclusive. Because that's what just kept coming up. Like I'm trying to remove my bias by lowering the reading grade level and not assuming that this is a college educated person but I'm going up against college educated people who want it to be at a higher level. And I just wondered how we deal with that internally. It's very interesting. I don't um, have an answer. Your, your best answer is you probably one that's not available to you, which is to have data on your users. <laughs> if you're very lucky, <laughs> you have such things. And then you can provide evidence that says, this is who our users are. This is where they're coming from. Um, right. I know we are not always so lucky to have that, you know, data backing up what we know from our experience working with the users directly. But uh, I, I do understand the the kind of advocacy role, uh, you know, I think that's often we're kind of that last line between the users and the products, making sure that they're going to be able to use what's being built. So it, it's something that I think is a challenge for our profession. So unfortunately, it's it's not, I don't have an easy answer. I wish I was like, all right, Jessica, here's, the, you do this one yeah, <laughs> I don't know if any of us do. I, I, uh, it's just it's it's something I've come up against in the past, and especially when people are posturing posturing in a corporate setting, mm -hmm. language gets involved in that just sort of one-upmanship, and yes. you're saying you know, and and that becomes a problem where it's it's a very, it's a very interesting conundrum in this context because it it you're being exclusive. And they don't even see it that way because they're busy posturing. And it, it, it sort of is like the final blocker to all this work you put into being inclusive. And then you get stopped by someone who, uh, I don't know, it's a strange, it's a strange conundrum. So thanks. I just thought, I thought I'd bring that up because it's a. Yeah, I no, I appreciate that. Um, I think it's easy to write for ourselves. It's the easiest audience to write for. We understand ourselves easily. Uh, we, we know what our intentions are and it's a piece of cake. Uh, unfortunately, that is not who we are writing for most times. Mm. Uh, can I ask a question? I just, something, there's something that I'm having trouble getting my head around. Um, so earlier on, uh, I remember seeing a slide about like things called like white privilege and male privilege, but mm -hmm. I'm a little bit confused. I thought that a privilege was like something you earn from like good behavior or something, but you don't like earn being white or male. So... I'm not sure I understand. Could you explain it a little more clearly? So it looks like uh, you're just looking at kind of a different definition of privilege. Uh, the, the, I tried to give the yeah. specific the definition I was working with because I thought that would kind of help ground what I was saying. Because uh, you're talking about being granted privileges, I think is what you're yeah. saying. Yeah, um, right. Yeah, in which case it's still something that is granted to you. Um, so it's not something that you intrinsically you know, belongs to you on its own, if that makes sense. So I'm uh, kind of trying to bridge the gap because English is a fun language, there's not any one definition for a word, but uh, that's the terminology that's typically used when talking about inclusive communication. And I can always go back to that slide if you wanna see the definition that I used. Oh, so it's a question of like a specific vocabulary for inclusive communication. Yeah, and I think it's it, it's often used beyond that um, kind of in, in common speech more now, but I would say it's something that wasn't a common usage maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, but hopefully that, that helps. Okay. I think it does. Let me think about it. There we go. Let me go to, there we go. Uh, I wanted to be clear about the specific definition I was using. So, which was unearned access <laughs> to a social power based on membership in a dominant group. But that's like the opposite of the old way that privilege is used because it used to be something intrinsically that you did earn. Um, I think if you look up definitions of privilege, uh, I know words evolve throughout ages. Uh, I can certainly send you more if that would help um, seeing how it's evolved. I could always, so currently, Mary Webster calls it a right or immunity granted as a peculiar benefit, advantage, or favor. Hmm. I guess that makes sense. I guess it kind of works for both. Yeah. 
Mm, maybe it does, yeah. All right. Uh, other questions? I see we've got some good chat about, uh, you know, reading comprehension and the use of the word spurious. I, I know it can be hard for those of us who are word nerds who like to use fun words that uh, maybe they're not the most accessible <laughs> to everyone. Personal favorite right now, kerfuffle. It's a fun word, but I don't use it in my documentation. The thing that I run into problems with is like, I never know whether to write in like a more informal way to like speak to wider audience, not that there's not to the point of using idioms or anything, but like to say like, you know, you can master this if you do this, if you if that makes sense, as opposed to like, you know, one can do something or whatever. Yeah. I don't know if I'm making sense. No, I, I think it varies whether you use, you know, which which person and which voice you use it depends on, you know, the your communication, if it's something by email, uh, we use second person at my work and all of our steps. Okay. So we don't say you can do this, but you know, it, all the steps are written directly to the user because it's the mm -hmm. most efficient and direct way to communicate. Uh, if you work for a company, often those things will be defined in a style guide. So you'll have a oh, reference yeah. document where they'll say, right. here's the tone we use. Here's, we do use contractions. We don't use contractions. I've heard it's very controversial for some companies, whether they do or don't use contractions. We do, but sparingly in communications, but not in our documentation. <laughs> okay. So stuff like that. Uh, big corporations have to find if you're like a new technical writer, you're a small team. Uh, that's where you get to have the fun of defining your style guide as you go and writing down as you're working, what are the things you're, you are and aren't going to do in your communication. Um, so Julia or Jesslyn, do you guys have anything to add, whether on that topic or anything else? No, um, I don't. Okay. I do not either, but you can always email us if you have further questions. True. So true. Um, excuse me. I, I hope you don't mind me asking a question, but um, is I, I always thought that um, that uh, either second or third person, depending on the context, mm -hmm. could, could could be could be properly formal in, in in a document is is that is that incorrect is 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 second person inherently less formal um no i don't i think some people do perceive it as such it depends on what you're where you're coming from i i will say i've been in places where they it everything needs to be third person because that is the and no contractions ever it's all it's very structured and uh, specific about how they want it to come across others are a little more loose so I don't know that one particular person or voice is necessarily tied to always being formal or informal. And I, I'm not always sure if formal or informal is the right question to ask. Um, it's more about just how I think effectively you're communicating your message to your users and, and what format. So whether it's email, documents, website, uh, you know, it all kind of varies depending on what makes sense. So there's no, uh, there's no like one right answer, I guess is what I'm saying. I don't have all the answers. I just have lots of thoughts. <laughs> That was a good question though, Jessica. Hopefully that has reassured you. <laughs> Other questions? Or stories, suggestions? We've got time. You're, you're also allowed to let it percolate. We, we did give you a lot of information and, and <laughs> different perspectives, so. Do not feel like this is something that you have to soak in completely all in one sitting. Feel free to, to sit on it. Um, appreciate all the, the good feedback in the chat. I know some people and, are having to hop off for other calls. <laughs> and this is also why we put emails because it is a lot of information to digest. It's true. Oh, we have a question. Are there a list of uh, words that are no-nos to use in tech documentation? Uh, period, or with regards to inclusivity? I don't have one magic all-encompassing list, uh, but I will say, referring to our resource list again, uh, I know Google has for their developers a list of words and terms to avoid, specifically for uh, technical documentation that I highly recommend. And in general, I kind of keep my own list that I add to as I come across things that I think might be a problem. Uh, 
funny thing for Alex, uh, in our list of resources, there is a little uh, script somebody wrote that's available on Git GitHub called Alex that you can either install on your PC or connect to something like your Slack. I was wondering or about that. <laughs> yeah, it's we aren't pointing you to, to you, the person, Alex. If <laughs> you have any questions, Alex. <laughs> go to Alex. Uh, yeah, it's the name of the app uh, that will actually uh, screen your writing for insensitive uh, words and phrases and offer okay. suggestions for alternatives. It's very cool. And I did put a link to our annotated bibliography in chat. If you want it in there, I'm happy to do that. Yeah. Um, and I know Julia is a fan of Grammarly, which I have been using as well. And they will try to catch you too if you haven't installed in your browser uh, with, with words and phrases. It won't catch everything. But if you have something that's, you know, uh, 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 I guess on the no-no list, it will offer you a suggestion. Hopefully that answered your question. I could start listing off things, but I think that's probably not the best way to go about it. <laughs> Any last thoughts, questions, concerns, alternative viewpoints? No, I think this was great. Awesome. Thank you. I think one last note for me, and then I'm good. In this book, there are a lot of personal stories which may help explain different genders if anyone's interested. Awesome. Good to know. And otherwise, I would just say I recommend looking at the resource list. Uh, we did kind of see that potentially as a living document. So if you find something that's great, please feel free to send it to us uh, and we can add it. I know Alex sent me something earlier today, which I did not add to the slides, but I should have. If you don't mind explaining that, Alex, I can pull it up. Uh, sure. Uh, so I saw an article today that the that the White House um, contact information uh, form now asks you your, your pronouns. So uh, whenever you're filling out the information, they will use the correct pronouns um, whenever they... Uh, contact you. Yeah, and I can share the link. <laughs> we have uh, autocorrect. Uh, do you have a question about Animal Crossing, Rebecca? Because I can also answer questions about Animal Crossing if that's I'm what you. So can I? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so if you have any other resources you've come across that you find are helpful, please feel free. I guess I would say, Julia, do you, would you want them sent to you with the newsletter uh, email address? Yeah. To go in MTM? Yeah, and I see Jessica has found the Google's developer guide. I think they're really helpful. There's some on there like sanity check, which are ones I'm currently working on banishing from my, my list of terms I use. Yeah, there's some that are really funny. <laughs> That's what was making me laugh. <laughs> the 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 original term or the or the reworking the 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 recommended the original change. Original term. I, yeah. I I haven't used any of, of those, but I was like I've seen them in notes from developers <laughs> in the system. So you're like, oh, I know you. I've seen you before. <laughs> yeah, the, the long comment from the developer. Whoever wrote this code had no idea what they were doing. I have no idea what this is for, but it's a mess. Or you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of the things uh, coming from the, the privileged side, my, my dad is an engineer, so I've grown up around technology. So I've always made assumptions about what are terms and experiences I think people have had with technology. Of course, now I am old and everyone is completely in tune with all the technological devices around us, especially this year of the pandemic. It, it's been a great kind of a level setter, I think, in some ways for us all having experience like with Zoom. So true though. Okay, just a random aside. If anyone wants a fun experience, I recommend if you have of the if you can have get your parents to play Animal Crossing just for like a few minutes. If they're anything like my mom, it will be the funniest thing you've ever watched. Due to their lack of experience with what the how the game works and what is it you do in it. <laughs> That mixed with, okay, my mom is someone who is naturally very snarky and sarcastic, and she will just narrate as she's going along. So in the case of Animal Crossing, there you will hear things like, okay, so I'm in, in indentured servitude to a raccoon. Really? 
that is what the game is about. I know, and but it just gives this beautiful other like viewpoint where I was just sitting there going, you know, I didn't think about it, but yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah. Speaking of which, we could have a whole separate conversation on different generational expectations for communication, because <laughs> I know there's a lot that's been said there. Uh, I know I've often been uh, offended to be grouped with what millennials are considered to be. Well, it might be true. I, I don't like being told I'm entitled. I resent that, which might be an entitled perspective, but uh, there's certainly something to be said there for you know, adjusting different generational expectations. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes you can just make lemonade out of whatever lemon you've been handed and you never know it may just have you laughing on the floor for a few minutes after watching it happen yeah uh alex had a couple of notes we should use appropriate pronouns rather than preferred uh thank you for mentioning that and sexual preference has the connotation that could change so thank you alex there are always things i'm trying to work on doing better oh all right well, I think any last questions? Otherwise, we, we can wrap up. I just want to say thank you so much for this. This was amazing. Oh, awesome. I hope it's helpful for you. <laughs> Very much, yes. Great. Uh, it's been a good experience for me working on it with Julia and Jessalyn. I have learned new things. And I learned how much more I have to learn. So glad we could share that with you guys. So... I guess it, I guess will be uh, have a good night. Unless Julia, Jessalyn, any last thoughts? Thank you for your wonderful reception of our presentation. <laughs> Absolutely, and this was great. Thank you for letting letting me be a part of it. This it was a great. It was just fantastic. Thank you. And we hope to see you next month on Friday. Friday. <laughs> Friday, February twenty sixth. All and right. And I will be publishing a reminder for that very soon. Excellent. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a good night. Good night.